Hey guys, I have a special guest today. He's an American sports agent, philanthropist, best-selling author, and during his 41-year career, Steinberg has represented over 300 plus athletes in football, baseball, basketball, boxing, and the Olympics. He's represented the number one overall pick in the NFL draft a record eight times. And he's had over 60 first round picks in the NFL. On top of that, he's credited as a real life inspiration of the sports agent from Cameron Crowe's movie, Jerry Maguire. Lee has secured over $4 billion for his 300 plus clients. And even more impressively, he's directed more than 750 million of various charities around the world. Lee, welcome. We're excited to have you on today. Glad to be with you. Yeah. So, Lee, where does your story start? It's so incredible. There's so much compounding. Where does it start? <clears throat> well, it starts uh, growing up in Los Angeles. Um, and I had a father who had raised us with two core values. One was to treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to try to make a meaningful difference in the world and help people who couldn't uh, help themselves. Uh, now, my grandfather was in the entertainment business. He was in the restaurant business and he ran a place called Hillcrest Country Club in West Los Angeles. And it was the hangout of the movie community. So he would play gin rummy every day with old comedians like Groucho Marx and George Burns and Jack Benny. And um, so I sat on the lap of Marilyn Monroe and, and had an <laughs> autographed Elvis Presley guitar. Um, and I went up to uh, Berkeley my first year at UCLA and then to Berkeley and it was a tumultuous stage of the 60s. So yeah. we were demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. And the governor at that point was Ronald Reagan. And um, I was student body president. So every time we demonstrated, he cracked down. So I learned everything I needed to learn about the art of negotiating from dealing with um, then governor, later president uh, Reagan. And, um, and I was in a dorm uh, a counselor while I was working my way through law school and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm and uh, one of the students there was a young guy named Steve and uh, Steve Wozniak went down and formed Apple Computer with Steve Jobs and <laughs> we had another fellow Mike uh, Brian Maxwell who formed uh, Power Bar and a whole lot of uh, athletes and so Bartkowski ended up being the core, Steve Bartkowski was the quarterback yeah. of the team. He ended up being the very first pick in the first round of the 1975 NFL draft. <clears throat> and I, I had traveled for a year after law school and was looking at any kind of job other than that. And he asked me to represent him and we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history. And it started in Atlanta as, uh, as we arrived there. That is absolutely incredible. You've named a bunch of different cool things. Um, so you're telling me that you were the RA and you had Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple, and then Steve Barkowski, who ends up being the number one overall pick. That, that's just a very interesting occurrence. And then what were you doing during that year that you went away that caused you because everyone has the uh, impression that lee steinberg the greatest sports agent ever he is obsessed with sports he's a football guy he's a baseball guy he's a this guy but was that really the direction you wanted to go or it was kind of oh no i was <laughs> uh, i was raised to make a difference in the world so i saw myself you know as a great civil liberties civil rights attorney uh, and um uh, uh, you know, or maybe go straight into politics. And um, 
at that point, sports agentry really didn't exist. There wasn't a guaranteed right of representation. So a team could just hang up the phone and say they didn't deal with agents. And um, what really turned it for me was we arrived at the Atlanta airport and there are fleet lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere and huge crowds pressed up against the police line and we're gonna sign the next day. And the first thing we hear is we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney, Lee Steinberg, have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. <laughs> we switch you live for an in-depth interview. <clears throat> and I really saw then how athletes were the celebrities in communities across the country and how high their profile was, how they were the movie stars. And I thought, you know, if this would be an opportunity to use their high profile to try to trigger positive imitative uh, change uh, in, especially in young people. But we made it a policy at that point. I thought if every athlete would go back to the high school community and, and retrace his roots and either set up a scholarship fund at the high school or work with the boys and girls club or church, they could establish a legacy there. <clears throat> and then at the collegiate institution, um, pay back the scholarship or now something for younger players or do something with the weight room. So Troy Aikman uh, endowed a full scholarship at, at uh, UCLA or Steve Young at uh, BYU or Edger and James at the University of Miami or Kerry Collins at Penn State. And it was a way of rebonding them with those alums and keeping them part of the community and having an impact on younger athletes to do the same thing. And then at the Pro City, <clears throat> we challenged each of the athletes to find something in their own heart that they would like to uh, tackle, some problem, and uh, set up a charitable foundation with the leading business figures, political figures, and uh, community leaders to, to execute a program. So it's work done, uh, former running back for Tampa and Atlanta, uh, putting the 175th single mother and her family into the first home they'll ever own by making the down payment and, and outfitting uh, the home. Or it's uh, Patrick Mahomes uh, with his 15 in the Mahomes, where he gives uh, to a variety of youth charities, buying school lunches for kids, uh, fulfilling their dreams. <clears throat> or it's Tua Tango Vailoa setting up a scholarship fund at his high school. So it's a way of an athlete making a difference. And they also can message. So I had the heavyweight champ. Lennox Lewis cut a public service announcement saying real men don't hit women. And that could do more to, to influence uh, young adolescents uh, as to the proper way to treat women and, and tune them up to sensitivity towards domestic violence than a thousand authority figures ever could. Yeah, that it, it's amazing because for the company I have, it's Edwards Consulting, and we do personal development, personal finance with people, but there's five pillars. It's mental health, physical health, community service philanthropy, family, friends, and then spirituality. And this community service philanthropy aspect, most people go, Jordan, what are you talking about? What is that supposed to mean? What is that supposed to do? So when you talk to some of these different athletes, because as athletes come out, some of them have egos, some of them have this persona of, I'm just focusing on being in the league. And you're kind of going, no, you got to take this extra burden, this role player, you got to take this responsibility. Was that concerning in the beginning or people were receptive to that? Have you lost athletes due to that? Well, Here's the thing, when you represent athletes, you're cutting up a little bit of your own life to share with them. So you might as well do it with people who you share the same values with and who believe the same things are important. The most important skill is listening. 
It's being able to draw another human being out, cut below their surface responses, and understand their deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. And it's being able to understand whether it's short-term economic gain, long-term economic security, geographical considerations, family, spiritual um, uh, profile, uh, endorsements, uh, being on a winning team, the quality of coaching, the system, whatever it is, I need to understand uniquely what really moves another human being in order to put my head into their head and my heart into their heart and see the world the way they see it. So um, I made it really clear in the very first meeting I have with an athlete, but they already know that this is the orientation that will root you into these communities, will build toward second career, will ground you in a program that takes you to and through the draft mentors you at the highest level. And then at the end of it, you're looking to put players in the Hall of Fame, which we have 12 in football and some in baseball. And um, you're looking to have for them to have a great second career. So it's understanding that if you have players who are playing for the 49ers, then you ask them, are there any businesses proximate to Santa Clara where you train? that might be of interest to you. Well, high tech uh, and uh, venture capital. And so it's not by chance that Brent Jones, the retired tight end of the 49ers put together a $3 billion hedge fund or uh, Bruce Smith owns a construction company. Um, these athletes and, and actually three of our former players are minority owners of NFL teams. Warwick Dunn, who I mentioned, owns part of the, uh, of the Atlanta Falcons. So for this generation, they can be the owners, they can be the entrepreneurs, they can be you know, broadcast figures, but you have to work with them to build that. Absolutely. And I had um, a long time ago when I started the podcast, I had Ron Jaworski on. And he mentioned about that dynamic of there's only three years in the league on average. So for someone to make it is pretty powerful. And he's like, I ended up getting lucky. I had some people that were investing around me. How do you, it seems like you have the foresight to, obviously you've seen so many people's careers and understand that it's, hey, we need to set you up for a second career. Are most people, are they excited about that? Are they even comprehending that at the moment, or you're just seeing in the foresight because you've had so many experiences? Well, they're not comprehending it as they come into scouting uh, coming off a of college campus, but their parents are. And in most cases, you're dealing with parents who are the screeners on agent representation for their kids. And so they get that, the father gets that, the mother gets that. And um, it's, but look for athletes that's an abstraction it's long term uh, uh somewhere out there <laughs> but it is for everyone young and so it the best part of it is if i can help develop their non-athletic skills and some of the skills that sports teaches are like postponement of current gratification for future success it's uh heavy work ethic it's teamwork and working in a team situation it's using a, a vast body of information, a complex body of information in real time. And it's courage under pressure. And most importantly, it's resilience. What you do when um, adversity strikes. So what does the quarterback do when he's thrown a couple interceptions, the crowd is booing, the game is getting out of hand, the center's looking at the quarterback like he must be on hallucinogens. <laughs> and, um, um, and things have gone horribly. Well, it's the ability to compartmentalize, adopt a quiet mind, tune out extraneous uh, 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 abstractions, and elevate your level of play in those critical situations, notwithstanding the past, 
to, to take a team to and through victory. And that's quality you look for, it's resilience, the ability to, to function in crisis. All of us in life are gonna be pushed back, we're gonna be disappointed, we'll, we'll fail at something we wanted to succeed at, we'll have uh, uncontrollable uh, hardship come, uh, sadness. And then the question is, can you get knocked back, but then rise again and, and be engaged in the struggle once more? Yeah, I, I love that. And delayed gratification that is so relevant to all of us in, in personal finance, at, at everyone in their lives, because we jump so quickly to wanting it now. I want it now. I need it now. Where's the contract? Where's this? Where's that? And it's like, no, this stuff takes a long time to get going. So, And you, and for, you have a younger generation like Gen Z that's brought up on big computer screens with color and sound <laughs> jumping on and are, are interspersing uh, TikTok with Snapchat, with uh, every other form of social media. And um, it attenuates the tension span because everything is in quick bursts of of uh, stimuli and oh my god if you're 18 and you send a text to someone and they don't text you right back it's oh my god am i nobody <laughs> likes me i'm unpopular or if you post something on social media and you don't get enough likes for a young person it's like oh my god what a rejection the world doesn't love me <laughs> lee so in touch i love it so for you, when you are looking for these different athletes, we've obviously touched on uh, a lot of the intangibles, but to have eight number one picks is fairly incredible. What is it that these people possess or that you see in them that really separate them from the rest? Well, first of all, I mean, it's a cliche, but work ethic. Um, the people that succeed in professional sports what you're seeing in their performance is the tip of the iceberg. Underneath is endless hours of preparation, endless hours of physical training, endless hours of book study. It's over and over and over again. It's the basketball player that, that goes into the gym for three hours and shoots shots. You don't see any of that, but you have many gifted talents with athletic talent. But if they don't have the work ethic and don't put the time uh, into it, so you're, you're looking for that. You're looking for, again, someone that, that will give us all in ways that you probably can't see. Um, so that's, that's the first stage. And second, you're looking for intelligence, you know, just a bright mind. You actually have to be pretty bright to play a complex playbook in, in sports. And then you're looking for character, the quality of someone's heart and whether or not, you know, they'll do what we just talked about, which is rise again um, uh, when things get tough. What's their response going to be um, when, when they're not immediately successful? Will they keep uh, uh, trying and, and stay that way? So, it's, it's a set of qualities, a self-starter who is, um, I always say that, that I'm recruiting athletes who would be successful with or without me because they had the drive and um, uh, fortitude and vision to, to want to be something special. Yeah, that, that's, it's so true. And a lot of that relates to things outside of sports as well. I just bring this up so that the audience realizes that we're having a sports conversation here, but it's not, it's about life. And it's really applicable to those other areas. So I want to get into, I know you have a lot to do with uh, concussion protocol and different areas like that, because I realized that you were one of the first to bring that up. And that was really fascinating to me because as an agent, it's, most agents are, I want to make the most, like, I need my clients to keep going. I want to make the money. And it's more about the player's health than afterwards. Yeah. So dive into that. 
So I had a crisis of conscience back in the 1980s when I'm representing some weekends half the starting quarterbacks that keep getting hit in the head and other players too. And when we go to doctors to ask how many concussions is too many, what are the long-term ramifications? They had no answers uh, back in the late eighties and early nineties. And I thought, I can't really feel a lot of excitement about being in a profession if I'm leading young athletes down the road to dementia. Uh, their physical health is important if I'm just stuffing dollars into the bank book without being concerned about the fact that um, they may be impaired later. Um, so I started to hold concussion conferences. And the very first one was in the early 90s. And we had players like Troy Aikman and Warren Moon and, and Steve Young and Drew Bledsoe there. And they listened to neurologists. So I got the leading neurologists across the country to come and talk about what we knew about the effect of concussion. And ultimately had a conference where they came up with, with a metric, which was that after three concussions, you have an exponentially higher rate of uh, a propensity towards Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, premature uh, senility, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and depression. So I called it a ticking time bomb and an undiagnosed <laughs> health epidemic and kept fighting to, to have more awareness. And then the question was, how can we prevent them and can we find a cure for a brain already concussed? Because every time an offensive lineman hits a defensive lineman at the inception of a play, it produces a low-level subconcussive event, a little bit of change. So even if you're not knocked out cold in a way everyone can see, um, you could have an offensive lineman with 10,000 subconcussive uh, events, um, none of which have been diagnosed because they just feel stunned and continue playing. And, and uh, but the aggregate can do the same thing as three concussions. So we've looked at, at playing, uh, what age is appropriate for a young person to start playing tackle football because the young brain is in development. We've looked at ways to take blocking and tackling with the head out of the game. We looked at, could you just play a season without actual hitting during training camp and during uh, uh, practices, and um, which they do now in the Ivy League, and that reduces concussions. I've looked at helmetry, something that would really protect the head. We've looked at the best way to cure a concussed brain, and we have things like um, hyperbaric oxygen, which seems to help. There's a process which is electricity into the brain called um, uh, RTMS that seems to be helpful. Um, there's something that Dr. Jake Van Landingham put together, which um, if you apply it right when the concussion takes place, reduces the brain swelling. So we continue to search for ways to make the game uh, safer. My, my fear is if 50% of the parents in the country understand the danger of concussion, and tell their teenage boys you can play any sport but not tackle football. It won't kill football immediately, but it will start to have an effect over time uh, where the only people who will play football will be um, having economic need and they'll be the same people that box or do UFC. And gradually uh, the, the mainstream participation will go away. So it's, um, uh, I'm trying to make sure that every player understands this, but, but keep in mind, they're in denial about their health. Since, yeah. Pop, since Pop Warner and Little League, they've learned that real men stay in the lineup, that pain is just part of the process, and you have to stay on the field no matter what. And long-term health is an abstraction. So you have denial by a professional athlete who's surrounded by people who believe the same things. And then you have young people to denial. So it's like denial squared. You, wait, I love your, your vision, how you see it, because I, when you tell those stories, I recall moments in high school football 
where we would see athletes on my team. I grew up in uh, Ridgewood High School, uh, so Ridgewood, New Jersey. And we would have some people that would be like, I'm concussed. And then next week, they're suddenly fine. And it's like, that's not always true. But they wanted to get back on the field because a college scout might be coming or they might lose their opportunity. And it's so competitive that it was something that was constantly on the forefront. Well, what we know is that the younger the brain is, the more severe the ramifications. And um, if it takes um, that to do the first concussion, and now that player you talked about goes back to play, it takes that to do the second concussion. In other words, the brain's set up to be more easily concussed. So, um, um, but as I said, there are players suffering concussions that, that can pass the concussion protocol somehow, <laughs> and uh, uh, they're at higher danger and higher risk. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really thinking about yourself in the long term. But like you said, most people don't have that long term perspective of, hey, it's the now, this is my opportunity, let me take it. So for you, where do you, was this ever part of the plan to build this sports agency? And obviously, Steve came to you. And it, how did it end up going in such a football centric direction? I understand that you did have some great athletes in baseball and boxing as well and basketball. Well, I mean, but... we, I started representing baseball players in the early uh, mid seventies. And uh, we ended up with a practice with my partner, Jeff Morad that had over 60 players and uh, um, you know, some from CC Sabathia to Pudge Rodriguez from uh, Sean Green to Matt Williams um, some really uh, great players in basketball uh, uh, too. Um, it, when I saw the power that athletes had, well, well, first of all, I love sports. I'm a sports fan, grew up a Dodger and Angel and Laker and UCLA Bruin fan. Yeah. And um, so I love that aspect. It's also got the teaching counseling function where you feel like you're having an impact on young people's lives. Um, and the relationships are different. So Warren Moon and I were together for 23 years of his career. And this has given us the opportunity to, to tackle all sorts of societal problems, to do what I originally wanted to do because Take the environment. Um, we got climate change. It's here. It's happening too fast for people to move fast enough to respond to it. Um, so we created the Sporting Green Alliance, which took sustainable technology in wind, solar, recycling, resurfacing, and um, uh, water to state arena and practice fields to drop carbon emissions and energy costs and to transform those platforms into educational platforms. So the millions of fans that go can see a waterless urinal, can see a solar panel and think about how to integrate those concepts into their own homes and businesses. So you put sports in the forefront of uh, climate change or bullying. Um, so we created a program that got uh, pro and college players to talk to high school players because in the sociology of a high school, it's athletes who generally sit atop the heap, you know, in status. And so yeah. the, the athlete to put his arm around someone who's got a hair lip or stutters or is being bullied for some reason or another. And instead of being the bulliers themselves, they're the preachers of tolerance, you can change the culture of a high school. So I found that we could take on all sorts of uh, problems um, in the same way I could have politically. Oh, that's incredible. And, it, and it's great to see how you're looking at the world so uh, just holistically instead of just focusing on the sports themselves. And really, we, um, I just found everything that was fun for me in the world, writing, I can write for Forbes, I can write books, mm -hmm. it was uh, movies, you know, I can 
work on uh, Jerry Maguire and any given Sunday and for the love of the game. It was, um, uh, you know, charity, um, making a difference. I just put together the things that were sort of fun, public speaking, and made it a career. Yeah, and I, I actually, I, I've known about Lee for a long time, but I really got connected with him through uh, Sean Callagy, Unblinded, and the American Foundation for the Blind, which was September 23rd. We raised money for a lot of them, which was an incredible experience. Um, we, yeah, we were able to sell tickets to my Super Bowl party to raise money for $20,000 apiece, which, um, and we raised a ton of money. Or, but, you know, I did the same thing for domestic violence, where you have this concept where you auction off having lunch with someone. Well, for that one, it was 25000 which is about 24999 more than I would pay. And uh, but, but thank goodness, you know, when when you get sold for high fees to have lunch or Zoom or something, you wonder, what can I bring of value to this person's life to justify that amount of money? Um, yeah, it's a it's a fascinating thought. It is. Right. It is because I know you always break down things into different value exchanges and how everyone can help and be a win situation. So elaborate to the audience how the Super Bowl party works. Cause I know you've been doing it for, you said 35th years coming up. Right. Um, yeah. So we put together a party um, that reflects the convention of Americana that uh, Super Bowls become. So it's a big business, big politics, big entertainment, big sports. We give humanitarian awards to an owner, a general manager, a coach, a player, retired player for humanitarian philanthropic things they've done. And we've been able to, it's a daytime party. So now we're back in Los Angeles. Well, last time we were in LA, we were on the back lot of 20th Century Fox uh, on the whole Hello Dolly set of old New York. This time we're doing it at Sony Studios where we actually filmed part of Jerry Maguire. And uh, so that's the old MGM. Um, and we put people together and then we pick charitable causes. We do things like when we had servicemen in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had a live hookup so they could participate in the party. We, um, uh, when they had an earthquake in uh, Haiti and people were dying from lack of pure drinking water, um, we were able to ship a water machine that, that uh, purified water for 140,000 people a day. Um, we uh, raised money for autism. We've uh, brought, um, make a wish foundation kids and we've raised money for them. So it's a lot of fun because, you know, I've tried to program whatever's hot in American culture, you know, back, back to the days of Joe Millionaire or the cast, uh, cast of uh, Desperate Housewives or the Real Housewives of Atlanta, whatever's sort of hot in popular culture. So it's a, a fun time, but it's also educational. So we'll have a brain section where we'll have hyperbaric oxygen, we'll have light stem, which is a bed you lie on that infuses you with uh, energy and facilitates healing. We'll have displays of all sorts of the cutting edge biomed breakthroughs that can help not just athletes, but, but baby boomers like me. And, um, so it's it'll be a lot of fun. We'll have virtual reality. We'll have a, you can put the helmet on and you're Patrick Mahomes and you you're now playing uh, football in virtual reality. We have all sorts of displays. So it's it's um, um, and then our current clients and past clients and it's it's a, a real mix of Americana. I love it. it. It's it brings it all together. And that's kind of the big thing that is learning here is that it's not just, oh, I'm going to have a Super Bowl party with my friends, or I'm just going to have it be an educational thing, or it's just going to be an entertainment dynamic. It's bringing it all together. And this is so useful for all of us listening, because this is how we can conduct business. We can conduct business and bring all these pieces together and changing the way people really think about things. 
So think about this, when you were in college and you had to study and you had a girlfriend you needed to see, the way to think about that was take your girlfriend with you to the library, okay? <laughs> so how many utilities can you get out of the same uh, time? How many different verticals can you complete? How many different lives can you touch out of the same action? Because this moment is all there is. Um, I'm not thinking about what's on my cell phone or what to do later. And it, all my energy is focused here. And if you just do that, put every bit of energy into whatever's happening right now, and later you'll do the next thing, then you get the most out of it because you're listening to text and subtext and trying to uh, really communicate and bond with another human being. But there's so many things to do that multiple uses of time, there's probably 25 different utilities we get from the uh, party, including um, having people we do business with uh, there and the Players Association that regulates us and, uh, and uh, press and uh, coming as guests. And for one party, I remember we had Rob Schneider, the actor dressed up as the uh, exercise guru, Richard Simmons. Only he was the bad Richard Simmons. And he got drunk and he uh, ate ding-dongs and he did everything that an exercise guru wouldn't do. And they showed that on Jay Leno's show that night. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it, a... it had the real Richard Simmons as a guest and showed that. <laughs> I love that. That That's the kind of uh, good fun of bringing everything together. And I've actually been thinking about this utility mechanism because I was reading uh, Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. And he has this thing where you write down. 25 things that uh, remove you from pain and move you to pleasure. So like one of the things we did was I like seeing the sunrise. I like going on walks. I like working out. I like being outside. I was with my girlfriend. It was like five, 10 things at one time. And when you start to view the world like that, it, it's changing. It's life changing. Cause you're not multitasking. You're just putting it all in one concoction and seeing what works. Exactly. And you're in that time in that moment. You're not worried about what's happening on your cell phone or on a computer screen or uh, anything else. You're actually living in a real experience. You're not just a voyeur watching. Yeah, and it's really being present and showing up that 100%. Because there's a lot of us who sign up for a lot of different activities who aren't that excited to be there. <laughs> So I, I, I definitely is, appreciate that. This is where you need to do an internal inventory. So we talked about it with the athlete, but all of us need to understand what it really is that fulfills us. And it and whether it's family or relationships or or money or or uh, uh, profile or making a difference or whatever it is, it there's always time to look at who you are at this particular point in time, as opposed to what you thought five years ago or 10 years ago, and to make sure that you're in touch with where your fulfillment really comes from. Well, yeah, that's, I love that because if we're not measuring where we're at, then we're not gonna be able to go to that next level and we also don't even know if we're going in the right direction because there's so many of us that just sit there and think, oh, I have a job. I'm happy with that job. I got a promotion. My life's amazing. But we're humans and there's a lot more aspects to us than that. Right. For you, Lee, obviously you've had an incredible client list, incredible friends, incredible people in your life. And you mentioned relationships a bunch. What are some of the ways that you develop these very deep relationships because like you mentioned before you have half you're representing half the quarterbacks in the league i could imagine that people have problems in which case they're constantly reaching out to you want that personal connection how were you able to create that with so many people at such a such a brilliant level again by listening by 
really understanding uh, what someone else's needs are by not being so self-absorbed that you have a preset pitch that you have to make or a preset thing that you have to do. It's tuning into that other person. <clears throat> you know, real friendship is being there when it's not convenient to be a friend, when your friend may hit a low point in their life, when your friend might um, have some problem where it might not be all that great to be associated with them. Friendship is where are you in critical times um, when someone really needs you? So it's showing up in different situations. It's, it's being there in critical situations, being able to sense when friends, clients, and other people um, are in need and being able to uh, respond to that. So it's not being internally uh, oriented. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, when you stop thinking about yourself, and, and self-absorption, you know, enough about me. Can we talk about how you feel about me? Uh, that's <laughs> self-absorption. Uh, but when you start to tune in to the needs of other people around you, um, then it's, it's, you establish that level of sort of honesty and openness. And uh, you also need to learn the art of discretion because people tell me, their most deepest secrets. And you have to keep that uh, confidence with them so that I can be sitting in a room and people are talking about someone I know. And I know that what they're saying is incorrect, but they told me in confidence. And so I've just got to sit there and not correct the, them or, or break that confidence. So it's understanding that we can have a private conversation between us and and there are things you might tell me that you don't really want shared and i'll keep that for the forever uh as just something between you and me yeah that that trust factor of being able to be there when they need it and yeah I, I, it's awesome and now we've talked about how you do charity how you help the athletes beyond their career. Is every sports agent doing this? <laughs> or is it, it seems like you have a very unique approach. And I, I just want to clarify this for me, who I'm not that, if it, like I know about sports, I know about all the different sports. And the listeners might know about the sports, but we don't know the, about the business of the sports. Are all sports agents like this? Or are you unique in your own way? Oh, I hope there are many that are like this, but um, part of why we do an agent academy, <clears throat> which we have coming up November 12th, and people interested can go to, to steinbergsports.com and check it out. So I made a commitment to try to train and jumpstart the careers of young people that either want to be agents or want to have a sports career. So in the sports career conference, we talk about branding and marketing and, and television and being on air or behind the scenes. We talk about how to work for a front office in, in for a team, a league, a conference, a players association, a uh, uh, an athletic department. And but the agent academy we teach core skills so we have a recruiting exercise where you actually have to get up and recruit an athlete and his family we have a negotiation exercise where people actually have to get going on their um, uh, half of them uh, uh, play general managers and half of them play uh, player agents and they have the first pick in the draft and they have to negotiate for them we do a crisis control uh, situation where, where your player's gotten into trouble or something's happened. Now, how do you deal with that? How do you defend them publicly and the rest of it? We do branding and marketing. Uh, so you learn how to brand someone. Out of 100 people, can someone identify this name? And if they can, do they have positive feelings about it? So that's Q factor. 
And we do all of these exercises. We haven't set up a charitable foundation uh, in the Asian Academy. So trying to teach these values and creating a new generation of, um, of sports professionals that understand the power of sports to do good in the world. Um, we've done probably 40 of these conferences and there are some number of thousands of people out there who hopefully are on their way to a better career in sports. So um, I don't, I think that the general ethic is that a sports agent's job is to um, uh, make someone rich and, and negotiate money. But that's just a tiny part of the picture. Yeah, and for you, how do you, uh, well, actually, let's keep diving into the academy. The academy, it's November 12th. Is it in person or virtual? No, it's, well, we had to go in the pandemic to virtual, so it's virtual. Okay. But it's a life-changing uh, experience, and for it, the skills, although they relate to sports agency, all of us in our work have to recruit, have to sell, have to negotiate, you know, have to do uh, relationship management. So they're the same skills that would make you successful basically in whatever endeavor in life you would like to do. Uh, absolutely. So we're definitely going to share that in the bio. And I was just looking at uh, the calendar. It's going to be on a Friday. Um, so this is a pretty easy way to get proximity to Steinberg Sports and Lee. Yeah. And to... Uh and to learn specific skills, how to recruit, yes. how to negotiate, how to do client maintenance, how to do crisis control, how to set up a charitable foundation, how to set up a marketing branding thing, how to do endorsements, all, the, all of it. Yeah, and you're, you're learning from the best because it's happened so many times and he's giving you, showing you the instructions on how it's done, which well, is awesome. It's nice of you to say, I, I try. <laughs> So let's hear about, um, I know you've talked about it on a couple other interviews, but the, the Jerry Maguire stuff. How did that come to be? I ended up watching the movie two days ago. It's fascinating. It's timeless. It, it's funny. I, I reached out to a couple people. I'm like, hey, have you seen Jerry Maguire? They're like, Tom Cruise, 20 years ago? Yeah, of course I saw that. <laughs> people know it. Um, so how was that experience for you when they were following you? Uh, just, yeah, just elaborate. So Cameron Crowe, the writer-director of Jerry Maguire, had also written a book uh, called Fast Times of Ridgemont High. And um, if you're young, you may not have seen that movie, but it's hilarious. So he called and asked me if he could follow me around to do a film that had a central character sports agent. And um, so he went with me to the draft in 1993, where I had the first pick, Drew Bledsoe. He came to the league meetings where I was showing off a free agent uh, named Tim McDonald. He came to Pro Scouting Day at USC, came to games with me, Super Bowl parties. Uh, and he talked to people in that world. I introduced him, but I told him a ton of stories and uh, lots of stories. And he went off and wrote the script, Jerry Maguire, and I was technical advisor. So my job was to vet the script to make sure that when you're in a movie, that it, it requires a willing suspension of disbelief. You have to yes. give yourself to the fact. So if the dialogue's phony, if the look on the screen is phony, a real sports fan is going to know that's jarring and it will take you out of the plot. So we had to make sure of that. And then I, he assigned me some actors to work with. So I took Cuba Gooding Jr. down to the Super Bowl in Phoenix and made him pretend he was a wide receiver and my client always. <laughs> and so he hung out with Desmond Howard and uh, Amani Toomer. And uh, I actually had to show the quarterback in the film, Jerry O'Connell, how to throw a spiral because he had gone to NYU and they didn't have uh, football there. <laughs> and um, so um, um, at any rate, a lot of life went up on the screen and it's been 25 years and I rarely can walk through 
an airport or go out to dinner without someone running up to the table or and either saying to me or asking me to say those four words that start with show me the <laughs> I love it show me the money um and it is this something and I, I realized right there what you did when you had that when you had a pro with you you were doing multiple things at once not not multitasking but doing multiple no, hitting so at the, the same, same time way, yeah. at the same time so you know i needed to talk to jim ursay the owner of uh, the indianapolis colts so i went out to dinner with him but i took cameron with me so we had some business talk but you know he was basically there and it, and it was like a fly on the wall where he could see things and then he interviewed people around me about their take on whatever was happening yeah and it's incredible to see it because that's what we need to do where you can do multiple things at once and um when I heard that on a couple of different interviews that once you did that and you did the circuit and you did the, uh, some of your books came out, that's when the celebrity status really started rising. Was that, are, are you still? Um, well, there was a year, probably um, uh, the year 1984, Warren um, <clears throat> Moon came back from Canada and three different leagues competed for the first true free agent at a critical position um, at his prime. And so that became the biggest contract in NFL history. And then Steve Young, you had two leagues fighting against each other, the USFL and the NFL. And he signed a, what at that point was major money because it was a $42 million contract. So it was the biggest in sports history. And the confluence of those two things bang bang coming together was was uh brought a fair amount of attention yeah and for you you've had numerous top contracts in the league how do you do it because i was hearing that when you brought in steve uh borkow one more time steve borkowski um it was you were able to leverage other leagues now, when they're all in the same, how do you do it? How do you do it consistently? It's, just, it's the same thing. It's, it's researching the person you're going to negotiate with. So you want to look at their history. And then you want to look at their position. Is it a general manager who has to report to an owner? So he's on call for that. What are the pressures on that person? What are the needs of the team? So it's trying to create a win-win scenario where the player's being handsomely compensated, but the team's also getting a great player and, the, and we're fulfilling their needs too. So it's, it's being able to do that. We're largely in sports in a verbal industry. Yeah. We can make a huge deal. You could sign Patrick Mahomes a big deal and announce it before any contracts have ever been signed. And that happens all the time. Well, in another field, you'd be exchanging cables and things would be, there'd be all sorts of proof and the rest of it, but we're oral. So it all rests on repetitive business and the quality of the relationships you have. So if I do a great contract one-on-one -on -one with Jerry Jones, then I can do the next one. And the other key is to make sure all the credit goes to the other side. It, the deal happens because you have a gifted player and an enlightened uh, front office. Um, my part of it is I'm, I'm just along for the ride. You need to know how to credit other people uh, with the situation. So you can either have power in the world or you can brag about having power. And if you brag about having power in an arena with rich billionaires, that power will quickly dissolve. Yeah, and that's, uh, it sounds like that is one of the keys to your success and being around and being able to do this for so long, because. Well, it's, it's able it's, to tell, what I told the owners was, look, we're doing this wrong. We're having these nasty public negotiations for a player. 
and the players sitting out of camp and we're pushing fans away. And then we have negotiations for collective bargaining agreement with millionaires fighting billionaires. And that pushes fans away. Isn't our real job to compete if we're football with baseball, basketball, home box office, Walt Disney World, Netflix, and every other form of discretionary entertainment spending? And if that's right, isn't the real goal here to build an NFL network, uh, a big television contract, stadia that have multiple ancillary revenue streams? Isn't the job for us to work together to build the brand so that we create this massive pie rather than sitting and savaging each other over an individual negotiation? If we can make the pie big enough, the rest will flow. And that, I love how you just constantly are changing the perspective, changing the idea of this isn't me versus you, but it's actually us versus them. And there's not a lot of people who are willing to stand up, even if they believe that they might feel that they've been mistreated or not, not going to step in that because you're looking there, there might be some conflict that comes your direction. Like it's true. But don't, but don't share it publicly. So the point is, if you take another human being and push them up against a wall, then you're very likely not to achieve your results, but to get deadlocked. And when you get deadlocked with two parties locked into positions, um, then, then what happens is if you think things can't get worse, they can, <laughs> they do. And then it's very hard to unlock someone who's taken all this, you know, pride and principle into a stand they've taken. So don't push a losing argument to the end and never push another person into an embarrassing or challenging situation um, publicly. And of course, privately, be careful with your language and how you present. Absolutely. So for you, obviously, you made thousands of deals representing all these different clients. And are, are there times that you're willing to, like, obviously, everything's a negotiation. You're trying to help the player, you're trying to help the team, you're trying to make everyone happy, you got the relationships. Sometimes things have to go somewhat sour a little bit. Like, it. it it seems like oh. a very, because you're 20, like you came in at 25, right? Representing right. Steve. And it, how'd you learn it? Like, it's fascinating, obviously Reagan and that stuff, but it's interesting. By, by being student by president of my high school and undergrad and, and, and law school and understanding that at the end, it's all about people. The really important study is psychology. Because if you can anticipate how other people Feel. But again, it's the ability to put yourself in another person's heart and mind if, um, and understand that whatever they say may not be what you want to hear, and it may not be your perspective, but you got to get into it and understand why their perspective is the way it is. And remember, in sports, we do repetitive deals. So the only thing that's clear is if I'm going to deal with uh, uh, you know, Bob Kraft or the Rooney family in Pittsburgh. Once, I'm going to deal with them multiple times. So yeah. having that trust factor, so there'd be a situation where um, we, we did Ben Roethlisberger's contract in 2004 with Dan Rooney, and he wanted a number of years that was larger than what we wanted to give. And we wanted other things that he didn't want to give. So we compromised and we gave him that term. He said to me, Lee, if Ben is a great achiever, we're going to redo this contract. You have my word on it. So they wanted multiple years. Of, I think it was six rather than five or five rather than four. And so I knew that the only important thing was Dan Rooney. And the fact that he, the Rooney family is always going to own that team. And, and we wouldn't run into a situation where Ben was really under salary by giving up term uh, mm -hmm. because the owner would take care of it. So 
how do you explain that to the world? You can't really, but you know in your heart that if in Pittsburgh I had Neil O'Donnell as quarterback and Cordell Stewart as quarterback and now Ben Roethlisberger uh, in 2004, um, I know how these people operate. And I know yeah. if, if he needs that extra year, um, even though it's a term longer than what we want, uh, give him the extra year. Yeah, so it's making everyone feel good because you, and this residual dynamic happens in all businesses because the world is pretty small. So I just want to make that aware for the listeners. Yeah, and, and look, here's the thing. When you are in a business situation and someone's neck is exposed and you have the ability to stomp on it, uh, don't do it. Because the only <laughs> thing for sure is that your neck will be exposed at some other time. So yeah. it's all about relationships. And most of us are in the field where we do repetitive business and we deal with similar people over and over again. And it's not worth it. You, yeah. you, you get, so I'll give you an example. A general manager does a contract with me. And when the contract shows up, Clearly, they've made a mistake because there's an extra $100,000 in it. And I don't just tell the player to sign that. I have to send it back and say, you must have made a mistake. This is more than what we agreed to. Yeah, which is yeah. integrity. And people right. want to do business with that again. Yep. Yeah, but, but the real reason, you don't want to... Uh, expose that general manager to ridicule and and, and uh, on an even bigger note because it's not the money it's really them making the mistake yeah right and so you know we all make mistakes so the point is you didn't agree to it don't sign it till it's right <laughs> yeah i love that so lee i know you've done a couple other things and i'm, re I'm really appreciative of your time i know you've done a couple other things with keeping teams in certain areas what made you think that you had to do that with the giants because um well the funny thing about it is i grew up a dodger fan and of course we hated the giants <laughs> yeah exactly. Ma mayor jordan called me from when he was mayor of san francisco and said the team has signed a binding represent a binding sales agreement with tampa bay and my instinctive response is, this is not good for sports. When you move franchise, how can you say you're our San Francisco Giants with the implied obligation that fans need to support the team when they're losing, win or lose, they're your Giants, and now all of a sudden take them away when you've loyally supported them because they got a slightly better business deal. So we organized... Um, Everyone was treating it as a fait accompli, but I brought a friend of mine, Larry Bear, back from New York. He put together an ownership group. We convinced the National League it wasn't in the best interest to do this, that they still had local support, and uh, we were able to, to save the team. And I did a similar thing with the uh, Oakland A's. That mayor was uh, uh, with that mayor and who's Elihu Harris and um, kept him in, in town. And I was outraged when the Rams were gonna leave Los Angeles. You see, if, if there's not a compact between fans and a sports team that you're gonna stick together through thick and thin, then what do they have? Why would you root for a private business really? It's not like the college you went to or the high school you went to, it's a private business and put loyalty into it if they're just going to move. So I've opposed all those moves, except if you really have a team where the community won't support them at all. And it's just a bad market. But San Diego wasn't a bad market um, before the Chargers came to Los Angeles and they lost their team, which wasn't right. Yeah, no, I definitely understand that. And it, it's, it's amazing seeing it from your perspective where you're seeing the whole picture of the impact. So quick question, just from a Tampa perspective, uh, there's talks of the Rays leaving St. Pete and going over to Tampa. It's not a huge jump, 
but is there any uh, effect there or any anything that you know about that? No, I, to, I don't. But to me, is if you're in the same market, you're in the same market. I mean, after okay. all, remember that <laughs> that the New England Patriots don't play in Boston; they play in Foxborough, and the yeah. New York New York Jets and the New York Giants play, you know, in the Meadowlands, which is New Jersey, and um, so as long as you're keeping it in the same geographical market with the same access and ability, um, you know, uh, that team has traditionally been really well run because even when they haven't had huge money, they play so well. So they've been a great franchise. They just don't get supported enough. Yeah. We final question. What is it that will allow someone to have a fulfilling, successful career? Because you went into this sports agency. It wasn't what you expected, what you thought, what you were, the direction you were going to go. But you made it work in an incredible way that no one else has seen. So, I, how so can, I, yeah. Yeah, I think that vision is really important. Can you see beyond today and understand where markets are developing where the economy is moving, what's likely to be a successful area in the future. In other words, if you could take the sport of football, and when I started, each team got $2 million as their share of the national TV contract, but you had to see this sport was gonna transfix the country. And it, it, it was the right sport with TV in the right time. So it's having vision as to which areas are gonna, make a difference. And then it's putting yourself in a position where you either, if you're working for someone else, you, you look into their life and think about how you can add value. Um, but the most important thing is do you believe in the quality of whatever it is that you're doing in business? You know, do you believe in that you're enhancing people's lives by helping them with financial planning. Well, obviously you are, and, and making a difference. Do you have a fundamental belief in what you're doing? Because if you do, that will allow you to unlock passion. And if you have passion for what you're doing, then you're gonna be much happier. Thank you, Lee. This has been absolutely incredible. Great.